wasn't that a brilliant witness report? <laughs> you know, when no one can go there except bloody Chris Kenny. <laughs> what a superb journalist he is. <laughs> this is so important, you know, to have these eyewitness reports and we really have to be very grateful for the workers who have actually stood up and spoken out. I see the other side, um, the things that Thea was talking about and when she said that she saw the treatment as regular, degrading and cruel treatment, seemingly without reason. I listen to the women that I've met in the Mitre and the Biter, and I know there are people here who visit Villawood and have, uh, as witnesses too, and, and we are witnesses because we have to listen and remember because this is going to be our history. But I listen to the women and the things that Thea was explaining, they just, they say to me, I don't want a visa. I don't care about anything. Just don't send us back to Nauru. That is their constant refrain. And then you listen to what Thea's explained of day-to-day -day life. Some of the women that I've met, I've known for 9, 10, 11 months because they've been in our detention centres for so long. And it has taken that time before the level of trust that they sit down and take your hand and with tears pouring down their faces tell you about the time they were raped in the tent, either by Nauruan workers or by Wilson security and sometimes and mostly they don't know who and they have held that secret so when the assess is under reporting I can confirm there is under reporting some of these women the last thing they want to do is tell their husbands I was talking to a woman two weeks ago she has held this dirty secret inside her it has really twisted and almost torn her apart, but she can't tell him. She said, you've got to understand my culture. So when we talk about the violence against women, it's not just the violence. We're talking about what we're doing to women that they're going to have to live with for their whole lives and find a way. And I think Western women who suffer violence know that it is a struggle to find their way back to health, to confidence, to self-esteem, to believing in themselves. What of these women? When did it start? I remember back in 2012, we got about five or six women came from Christmas Island to the Mitre. They were all pregnant and they came over for scans. Um, they were pregnant to a couple of months, not very pregnant and they were going to be sent back. And um, at that time, um, I was allowed to take them out. So we went shopping in the centre of Melbourne via Morris Blackburn. <laughs> sort of essential, really, when you're going shopping in Mars, to sort of slip through Morris Blackburn. <laughs> and that began some things. And I remember the young women lawyers, when they heard these women, went out shopping and came back these women on Christmas Island, by this wealthy country of ours, had one pair of knickers. I saw women with their tracksuit pants so tight they were cutting into their skin, looped underneath their developing bellies. The conditions on Christmas Island, as we know from the Human Rights Report, were atrocious. And then we moved them to Nauru and Manus. Don't forget Manus. Remember, we sent women and children with their parents, with their husbands and fathers and brothers to Manus. Six of those women were pregnant. Three of them lost their babies. The research, how can we research this? Um, these women are brave and clever. One woman 
gave me her vaccination card. She snatched it off the table when I HMS weren't looking. Because she said to me, how come we've been given the needle 18 times? I said, my God, what are they giving you? She said, I've got a card, I'll show you. So I looked up all the, all the vaccinations, so I vaccinated for everything under the sun. And five of the vaccinations were um, recommended against in early stages of pregnancy. We don't have the research on that. We don't have the documentation because we're not allowed to know. This is our problem. If we knew, we could do more. But, so, what happened when they arrived on Christmas Island? You remember when we were all concerned about the unaccompanied minors? We were so worried about these kids going to be sent to Nauru. Who was going to be responsible for them? The Nauru government had no child protection laws. Who was going to look after them? While we were engaged in that debate, there was a slate of hand that we didn't know about. The Somali girls who arrived as unaccompanied women on Christmas Island, quite a number I've talked to, spent 24 hours on Christmas Island before they were shoved in a plane and flown to Nauru. Somali girls, Iranian girls. Uh, there were a, a people from other countries, but in the main, we still can't get a positive number. I have a number 64. Sometimes people say it's as high as 80. These women were unaccompanied. They'd come across the seas on their own. They'd gone through a journey. God knows what happened to them on that journey. These girls, the Somali girls, have stories that make those biblical movies that we grew up on look tame. Girls who know about Al-Shabaab, who know about bombs and villages and brothers and fathers beheaded. I mean, horrific stories. These women have survived and they've made their way across the seas and wound up on Nauru. That happened quietly when no one was looking and no one knew. Then what happened, we had Iranian and Somali girls. The Somali women were in the camp, couldn't understand. Why weren't they being processed? They weren't being interviewed. The Iranians were. And in the way of human nature, they're looking for difference. And some of them said, it's because we're black and they're white. You know, when everybody's suffering, they look for difference. It actually turned out that they couldn't get female interpreters. Somali interpreters are always hard to find. Couldn't get female interpreters to go to Nauru. So it was slow. Eventually, these women were released. And Thea talks about the well-documented UN conditions for keeping women safe in camps and in these vulnerable situations. They have been absolutely ignored in every respect on Nauru. What's happened? You see, in the women's single women's camp, why did they put male guards on duty? Why did they have male guards walking around the camp all through the night? What genius in immigration thought that this was a great idea? Why couldn't those women get up in the night and go to the toilet? Because the male guards are all sitting around the toilets, half the time drunk, because nobody supervised them. So there was no safety. When they eventually got released into the community, because of the Nauru societal structure and because Australia is desperately trying to force money into the pockets of everybody to shut them up, the way they have uh, settled people in the community is on the tribal landowner groups. They're not, they're not tribes in the true sense. We're talking about a very small population. 10,000 people, they say, on Nauru, but they don't tell us how many people are actually on Nauru because many of them are in New Zealand. So the, what they've done is they allocate housing. They put these, uh, you know, demountable houses on, wood, on land in different parts of the island, and then the people who own that land get the money. Well, actually, the, the lead tribal landowner gets the money. The people down the line don't, so they're bitter. So that for this reason, they've got people spread out across the island. You'd think, logically, that you would put the women, at least in Anabare, where you've got a guard and you've got a fence. No, no, spread around the island. I know girls who were put in a demountable housing. They couldn't lock the front door. 
They used to use a knife to jemmy the door open and shut. They used to hide the knife in the garden. In order to get down to the van that goes around, the van bus that picks them up and takes them to the supermarket, they had to walk through the bush. There are wild dogs in the bush, and there are many men with very um, undesirable in intentions. And this is how these girls are getting raped, getting abused on the way just to go to the supermarket. They're not even safe there. So you, you'd have to say when you examine the evidence that there has been a deliberate policy of making sure these women's lives were as miserable as possible. Why? How many Somali women can be sent home? We don't even send Somali men home. How can we send them back? We know we can't send the Iranians back until we've done a deal with the Iranian government, which still hasn't come off. So why? Why this, this cruelty? And this is the struggle for us, because so much of it is mindless. You've got to say, it's deterrence, it's punishment. One of the few things they did was that they allowed people to make a phone call home once every two weeks. One of the Somali women told me, yep, they wanted us to ring home and tell our friends and family how bad it was in Australia so that no one else would come. How cruel is that? God knows. Then you've got to look at the underreporting. Of course there's underreporting. As one young woman said to me, after she was raped. I didn't go and tell the police because if I told the police on Nauru, everybody would know and I don't want them to know my business. Then she said something I thought really sad. She said, I have got nothing left except my name, my good name. If I lose that, I have nothing, you know? Then you've got to look, it's not just Nauru, and it's not just Manus. It's also here, on shore, in good old Australia. You know that country, that great democratic country? We who are so generous, you know we're such a generous nation. We've all heard the lines from Canberra. God, we could recite them in our sleep, if we weren't vomiting. <laughs> we, who are so generous, Border Force came in technically, legally, on the 1st of July, but they actually slithered in around May. I remember going to the Senate um, hearing, I think John Highfield and Trish were there, I think there might be a few others who were at the Senate hearings here in Sydney in May, when the Border Force guy got up and he was explaining to the Senators the purpose of Border Force, because the Senator was saying, why, why are we putting a new structure who are you replacing? And he said, no, no, we're not replacing anyone. We are there to put Serco on steroids. I remembered that line well. I thought, geez, what an idiot. Um, but that is true. That is what they were there to do, is to make Serco tougher, harder, meaner. And they have been doing it in Melbourne, and no doubt you're seeing them doing it in Villawood. And certainly I saw them in Brisbane. So now, we have women who are going out for counselling, following uh, violence, women who are going to hospital, and what do they do? Two guard, a, two, a guard, female guard has to, with two hands, squeeze up and down their arms, up and down their legs, stick their fingers under the bra, and stick their fingers in the groin. A male guard is standing there filming this. How is this appropriate? Next time you go to Villawood, Talk to them. Talk to the women. Find out what's going on. Sometimes the people who've come from offshore, they don't know Australia. They think they just, you know, we all normalise the things that we can't understand. They normalise it. But we have to know about it and we have to talk about it because this really is the last gasp. This is going on in Melbourne. Some women decide not to go out at all. You know, Serco have to tick some boxes under the new contract. And you'll notice one of the boxes is that they have to provide um, an, a, an, they call it an excursion, for anyone in detention more than two years, or just under two years. So what they do in Melbourne, because they're tremendously creative, 
They search them, they feel them up, then they put them in a van, never more than three or four people. Mostly they try to keep it to one family group, usually four or five guards, and then they drive them to a park where they get them out, usually keep them, make a drive three quarters of an hour or so, get them out, sit under a tree for 15, 20 minutes, get back in the van, go back. Tick a box, they've had an outing, they've had an excursion. Tremendous for your mental health, isn't it? You know, this is the sort of rubbish that we're watching now. I think one of the things that angers me most and a couple of the women in Melbourne, uh, we were allowed to take people out. It sounds incredible now when you think about it, but we were allowed to take people out without guards. So we used to go to restaurants in Sydney Road, we used to go to, sometimes we went to, even went to the museum, we'd go to parks, we'd take people to visit their friends. For four, five, six hours, they would feel human. They would, as they said, we want to breathe the free air. And then we take them back. And now we're not allowed. Now we've been stopped. Border Force are a little bit um, kind of cherry at the moment because uh, John Fain, who's our ABC local man, discovered this issue and um, ran a, quite a number of radio programs on it and uh, it was painted as the nun, and suddenly I became a nun. I <laughs> was a little misplaced, but Bridget, God bless her, she is a nun, but she's a nun of substance, I can tell you. Suddenly, the nuns aren't allowed to take children out, and then stupid Border Force put out a media release saying there were reasons. They had been taken to inappropriate places. Mention was made of alcohol and non-prescription drugs. Of course, this went over like a lead balloon. All the ABC um, folk rang up and said, the nuns never let us do anything. What do you mean they're taking the kids out and feeding them grog and drug, not prescription drugs? And where are they taking them? So it sort of fell flat. But the bottom line is, we still aren't allowed to take them out. And it's heartbreaking. You see people, all of us who visit, know when you see the light go out of their eyes, and jeez, it just, it really breaks your heart. And it's, this is the insidious thing. And we've got to find a way to spread this message. I think right now, we have come as close as we've come in the last few years since Cornelia Rao and since that little boy, that little boy who was catatonic in Villawood. We're now as close as we're getting and we're not making it yet. But there are a third of the population who are disquieted. They don't like what's happening. They know it's not right. There's a third who we think are persuadable and we've got somehow got to reach them. We've got to get them on side. There's a third, they'll never get them. But that's democracy, isn't it? You can't win them all. But we really have to because we've got to, we just can't let this go on. It's not just the people in detention. It's not just the people on Nauru. It's this nation is tearing itself apart. We're losing our soul. We're losing our respect for law. You can see what happens in the High Court. Decisions that they make based on the law because the government's framed it so. But we know it's not right. So this is our struggle. This is our time. Um, some of us are old enough that we kind of come to face the fact that we'll be gone before we can turn this around. But there's some in this room who are young enough. By God, I hope you get to smell the sweet success of seeing this nation turn into the people that we want it to be. A decent, humane, human rights respecting nation not this miserable, mean, twisted mob that is control of us now. So I leave it there. Um, we've got a hell of a struggle on our hands and we're going to have to fight it. The 267 is just the beginning. There's all those left there and there's all those still in our camps for no good reason. So all power to you.